Hello again, everybody. I'm Jamie. And I'm John. And I'm Justin. And this is the Elvis Archival Preservation Society. If you're a big Elvis fan like us, this is your society, our society, the EAP Society. If you're enjoying the videos, be sure to like, share, comment on the video, uh, subscribe if you're not already subscribed to the channel. When we hit 20,000 subscribers, we're going to give away an Elvis-owned item, so definitely check that out. And uh, consider becoming a member of the EAP Society to get in on the ground floor. They get uh, Members will get uh, ad-free videos, extended videos, exclusive bonus content content and more. Uh, one of the first videos that uh, we talked to everybody, this is uh, Justin Gosman from the TCB cast, a uh, massive Elvis fan of the newer generation and uh, even newer generation than we are. And uh, the, uh, I still don't feel old, so I don't care. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, the, the one of the first times that we had you on our show which was uh, technically a live stream that we did over Instagram that I then took this and recropped re it this direction, um, was talking about the Elvis movie that came out in 2022. And I'd been on the TCB cast several times before mm -hmm. and all this kind of thing. And so we, we talked and had a great discussion about the movie. And, you know, perspective being what it is, and it's been, it's been roughly a year since it came out. Well, just as you know I, I'm it, just flying by it's crazy to think about yeah I mean we basically what goosed us into getting the show in gear was saying we've been talking for years about you know we really need to do something we really need to do something and I, well, I was busy John was busy all this other kind of stuff and then we thought gosh you know what this movie is coming and this movie so far looks like it's going to probably be good so we need to get on this now and so that was what, that was what finally got our butt out the door to yeah. make this thing. <laughs> and so, uh, first off, thank you to Austin Butler, thank you Boz Lerman, and and Catherine Martin, and Catherine Martin, yes, indeed. And uh, apologies for leaving her out, but uh, it's been a year, and there's been a lot of things that have been said about it, a lot of things that I'm surprised have not been said about it. Um, pleasantly surprised that it had not been said about it. And here we are one year later and the movie and the impact that it's had and the number of fans that it's brought in and everything. Where do we begin on a discussion about Elvis, the movie, the Boz Lerman's Elvis one year later? Hmm. Well, I tell you. I'm going to bring this into both of you a little sorry. bit. Yeah. Yeah. Somehow I scooted. To yeah, put a little it. context on this, uh, where we were a year ago. I remember I saw the movie the night before Jamie saw it because mm. I went to the fan preview screen and it was a day earlier where I was. Well, when I came out of the movie, I texted Jamie, oh boy, we are going to have a ton to talk about. <laughs> and he texted back in a good way. Yeah. And I said, in every way. <laughs> just for context, and I talked about this in one of the other videos that we did. So... I found some pictures and things from when we went out to try out for the CBS thing. I went out to try out for the CBS thing that would eventually be the Jonathan Reese Myers. And first off, I'm really glad I did not get the part in that. But um, I saw an interview that Jonathan Reese Myers did where he said, they said, well, why didn't, you know, did you put on any weight or anything for, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, for like the 60 comeback special, Elvis was, you know, a little more built and, you know, all this kind of thing. And he goes, no, I didn't because I wanted to make Elvis look good. And I'm just like, mm -hmm. you, 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 you wanted to make Elvis look good. And that night I was in such a giant fit of rage, almost as big as the rage I felt after seeing the thing the first time. The uh, just the CBS special. The CBS, yeah, yeah okay. the two, the two, the two night CBS special that mm -hmm. played before Elvis by the Presleys. I was so incensed by that entire scenario, but I was so incensed by that interview alone that I went to the theater and I went to see Sin City, which is a really bloody, gory, whatever thing. It's like really artistically interesting because they they spot like one color. Like in the beginning, it's just red, so it's just just the lady's red dress and just the red lips and all this other kind of stuff. Really, really violent, really whatever. I loved every minute of that movie in a way that I would probably never normally because I was so <laughs> mad and it was just a great outlet. And my God, so. And then when the CBS 
thing played the two nights, John and I had five-hour discussions each night. Probably could have started our show then. I had five-hour discussions each night. Of course, I wouldn't have been calm, so there's that. And we, I basically, in real time as we're on the phone, fever dreamed a better film or series of films, including an ending that would shock and surprise you. Anyway, <laughs> including an ending that I think is amazing where... Ending Elvis's life from Elvis's perspective, uh, which either would go really well or really poorly. No idea. Anyway, so, and just to, to give you a level of, of just how absolutely incensed I was at that. So when John said, we're going to have a lot to talk about, I'm like, oh, with, with, the, with the Baz Luhrmann film, I'm like, oh, crap. No, not again. You know, and <laughs> and so so when that came out, and I know there are some folks that like the Jonathan Reese Myers film. If you enjoyed it, that's amazing. I had to straighten out so many factual inaccuracies that people asked me about after that thing came out. That's nothing but a horror story to me. But if you found enjoyment in it, I'm glad someone did. And I'm not trying to lessen your enjoyment. That's not the point. But man. And then to finally see it and to go, oh, thank God. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've, I've, it's been so long since there's, we haven't really, to my mind, we've had things that are good for what they were and things that you just, I didn't realize just how low the bar was. Right. And I thought I did. I thought I knew how low the bar was until this came out. I'm like, Wow. This is obviously the new standard, um, but wow, this is, so to, for me, uh, so much better than what we had before. And I understand people have, sorry, I, I, don't, I know I'm kind of monopolizing this a little bit. I know people have quibbles with the way Colonel Parker is represented. I understand that, and I agree with you. I know people are thinking, well, this isn't presented in historical context. I understand that, and I don't disagree. Um, but as far as, Finally presenting Elvis as something other than a joke yeah. was un intentionally or unintentionally was such a revelation in and of itself and was such a sigh of relief for me in and of itself that I was very easily able to overlook the other things because I'm like, okay, the one thing that has been nagging at me the whole time is they finally did one that fixes that. We can work on the rest for future stuff, but it fixes that. Uh, anyway, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, what, what I was going to say is like, uh, you know, obviously both of us, all three of us, I think, are fans of the film. Um, but I remember initially in our conversations, like we kind of had, there were parts we had to kind of work out how we felt about. It's true. It, it was not just an easy, like, okay, it wasn't fan service, right? Right. The, where, where you can just easily say, yeah, this thing is great. You know, mm -hmm. like there, you really had to kind of wrestle with what they were trying to do and the story they were trying to tell yeah. and why it wasn't necessarily the story you had in your head and all yeah, of that yeah, stuff. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, and, and it's, it, it's interesting because that's the way art works. Funny enough, that's how, you know, when, when people saw where Elvis turned his music after he got out of the army, there were folks that didn't really follow along because they had an image of Elvis. And again, that's, I get preconceived notions, right. good, bad, ugly, whatever, uh, kind of lead into, um, some of that stuff. I don't know what's up with my hands tonight. Just doing this kind of thing over and over, but the, uh, I think it's cause I don't have a table to plop them on. Uh, <laughs> the, I mean, I do, but I have to reach. Um, but yeah, it, it's really, I'm trying to think of, there were a few that I just wasn't sure. It's like, gosh, you know, but finding, I, I'm in a better place than I maybe was even 10 years ago to kind of look and go, okay, what are they trying to do? Mm. How do I agree with that? How do I disagree with that? What would I do differently? Mm. And we already kind of had an idea of what we were going to do differently because, we, again, we've written a non, what it essentially amounts to a nine-movie project. Right. We've got an outline for how we would tell the whole story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, and now I, I know this kind of gets us off topic a little bit, but the funny, the cool thing is, is this was Elvis's story from the colonel's point of view. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I mean, we can quibble about the way they portrayed the colonel, but. This is supposed to be Elvis's story from the Colonel's point of view. So I think it's really amazing that 
we still haven't had Elvis's point of view. And even with the movie that comes out next year, it's definitely not going to be from Elvis's point of view. So what's really cool is you can have a movie or a series or a set or whatever that can start with basically Elvis saying, well, you know, there's a lot of people telling from, from everybody else's side, but not from my side. And so this is how it, you know, is it going to tell from my side? That, I think, is really interesting and powerful for future movie talk. But yeah. let's talk about this. What was your first reaction? Uh, Justin, what was your first reaction after hearing or uh, hearing about it the very first time? What was your very first reaction? Sight unseen? Yeah. Well, to, to dip it back further, because... With TCB Cast, we've been doing the show since 2018. So you actually, if you go back to older episodes, you can hear Gurdip and I react in real time to news as it was coming out of the making of the film. And right. like, okay, they've cast Tom Hanks, they've cast Austin Butler. It's going to be this person. It's going to be filmed this location. Progressively over time, and throughout all that time, the one thing that I kept harping on on our show was. Elvis fans are not prepared for a Baz Luhrmann movie. <laughs> yeah. And, I, you know, interestingly enough, you say that. People who watch this know that I'm a cinephile. I, I have enjoyed Baz's films before, but the most recent one I had seen was The Great Gatsby. And mm. I hated The Great Gatsby. <laughs> and when they said Baz was doing Elvis, I was like, is this the right guy to do this movie? <laughs> and it turned out, yes, but... I didn't think so. Yeah. yeah. But, but even then, speaking to what you were talking about, Jamie, about expectations yeah i think the thing that baz lerman brought to the telling this particular telling of elvis's story is that he goes so big that he kind of forces you to check your expectations and if you don't if you go in with the wrong expectations and you don't go in with that mindset of what is he trying to do with this project yeah right you are going to have a bad time. Right. Because Baz Luhrmann doesn't work on conventional. No. He doesn't work on, like, the typical biopic uh, yeah. format. Yeah. It just inherently is not possible, I think, for that man to make a typical biopic. Right. No, or a typical film. Or a typical film, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, this is the filmmaker who... I, the the scenes that I will always point to are from Moulin Rouge. and I yes, will, I will, which I love. Which I also love has its problems mm -hmm. sure. but a lot of people really really love because it speaks more to the emotion of those characters right, right it's not so much focused with you know the narrative and the this and the that and it has wild moments that should not work in that film the scene that i always point to jim broadbent and uh, richard roxburgh doing like a virgin mm. yeah <laughs> in that film <laughs> contrasted with Roxanne. Yes. And you have this high melodrama of a sequence like Roxanne with this extremely campy, comedic uh, performance in Like a Virgin. And if you are not familiar with that style of filmmaking and you go into Baz Luhrmann's Elvis and you don't know that it's a Baz Luhrmann movie, and you go in expecting a film that's something along the lines of even something like the 2005 film, right. the 1979 film, right. Walk the Line, Ray, any conventional biopic that's been released in the last 40 years, right. you are going to have a bad time. Yeah. And so I, I was harping on that for the longest time. And so when I went in to the, see the film, my expectation was it's going to be a Baz Luhrmann movie. It's going to be wild. <laughs> I don't know what he's going to do. And I loved it for it, for that. That it forced me to go in with different expectations about yeah. what type of movie I was going to get. Right. So I think I was primed better because I knew what to expect, right. which was to not expect anything. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. And that's like, that's kind of how I eventually settled on it because like I, I had strong neg negative reactions to the great Gatsby because it's m m my favorite novel. Yeah. yeah. I have very specific ideas about how I would do it. And what Baz did was not at all what I would do. Mm -hmm. But having seen this movie twice, I think Baz may have been the 
only director who could have done Elvis's story justice in a two and a half hour format. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We will continue on that when we come back from these messages. Okay, we are back, and we are talking Baz Luhrmann's Elvis one year later. Uh, we've been talking a lot about, you know, like the initial re reactions and everything else, and we're going to continue kind of on that, that vein a little bit. I think you're right. You know, people were definitely not prepared. I On seeing some of the way the trailers were cut, oh, now people so are cool. used to seeing, yeah. yeah. The people, people are used to seeing trailers cut quick, but I don't know, something in the way this was cut so fast told me that this was that the movie was definitely going to have a similar kind of thing so right. that sort of prepped me i mean i've seen the others but i didn't really piece together oh that's what i should expect for elvis you know i didn't really but uh, he also did say over and over that he was kind of aiming at how to bring elvis's story the emotional thrust of elvis's story at least the way he saw it um into a context that modern younger audiences could grasp right. just because of the time displacement between when this happened and everything else and i think that that's an important thing to keep in mind you know i i we've we've got we've got friends whose opinions we very much value and respect and yeah. we, we love them and they were like it, it was cut it made me dizzy it was just cut too quick i was like so many things are happening i don't know what's happening you know i i can't take it i, I get that i can understand that i can understand that perspective like you said especially if you're used to like the John Carpenter film or, you know, or the, uh, or the 2005 piece, uh, uh, thing that was on TV. And, uh, so, you know, if you're not, if you're not used to something that's like, I, I, I hate to use it, but like TikTok ready, mm -hmm. um, it's definitely more aimed in that direction with that kind of, those kind of editing choices in that kind of world. And, I think it's one of those things that kind of, I don't want to say pays the Elvis story forward, but kind of does, I think it does do a fairly good job, for the most part, at least for Elvis himself, of contextualizing him to people in a modern setting that they can look at these other things with and... Kind of like, and I, I know we I, every episode with you we've we mentioned remixes, but the uh, you know sometimes remixes, for instance, a little less conversation, got people to listen to Elvis, and there are people who buy more stuff, and they do this it's the same yeah. thing. This does that in some ways in a cinematic form. One thing that I appreciate about the way that Baz and the entire crew and uh, the cast created crafted this story is that they remembered that Elvis was exciting. Yes. Because every other biopic has essentially been aimed at an audience that is meant to bask in the nostalgia of Elvis. Right. And it, especially the 79 one, where it's only two years removed from his passing. Right. You're meant to go, you were all there when Elvis was around. You know the gist of the story. Let's relive this together. And right. The highs of the highs. And yes, we'll have some drama in there as well because it's got to be a movie. It's John Carpenter. He right. does a great job as a director. Kurt Russell is fantastic for the time given the amount of resources available, yeah. time available for him to do that performance. Um, but all of the other biopics and stories about his life that have come since, it has skewed more towards people, aimed at people who already know Elvis's story. Yeah. And understand inherently why Elvis is exciting, why he was so great. Baz Luhrmann's Elvis is a movie that's made for people who don't just take for granted that Elvis was even interesting. Yeah. You know, I think a corollary to that point, and one of the reasons that I like this film so much, is that because the earlier films took for granted that people knew Elvis and sort of lived through the times they don't bother to try to answer the question, why Elvis? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. why did all this happen to Elvis and not Buddy Holly? Or right. not Richie Valens or right. Little Richard, you yeah, know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this film does grapple with that question. Yes. Mm -hmm. in, in a way that I think is, is very fruitful 
and yeah. and 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 ticks a lot of the boxes that I would like in my own film, just in a very yeah. different way. You well, know? and I think it re- you know everybody involved realized that it has to. Yeah. Because well, for a very long time, you know, we've talked about this in other episodes about how yeah, Elvis fans have been very defensive for a long time. You know, understandably so because they you know all of the attacks and everything that was happening. So everything that's been made in the Elvis world has largely been insular. And so, you know, and, and also this is the first time that something has been made. I mean, the last thing was, you know, as crap as it was, the last thing was 2005. Yeah. Unless you was get it, Elvis and Nixon. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, but I mean like something that told a wider Tried story. To tell them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Elvis and Nixon is one of those things that is just kind of talking about, like a one moment, right? And they kind of try to do a little bit of little little bit of stuff, but this is the first time that they've ever had to grapple with what makes the story of Elvis not the same as every other biopic that everybody gushes over, mm-hmm. and how do you make how do you how do you present that differently to set Elvis apart? Right. Yeah, and I think like you said, I think that does it does an amazing job in, in that respect, certainly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. Um, uh, it's also interesting to kind of consider, like, within the context of the times, how where the drama is found. Mm-hmm. You know, because like the Carpenter film, I think, is a very good film for the time, um, but it it sort of bypasses the question of why Elvis <laughs> and focuses a lot on Elvis's relationship with his mother, which I think is definitely important yeah this one does that less but what we gain is something that i think is very key to any movie that really understands elvis which is it it finds the drama in elvis's life to be the struggle to remain true to oneself Mm -hmm. yeah and i think that that's a very relevant theme that uh, to this point really has not been explored as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That, that's something that I think is a, is an idea that resonate has resonated with younger audiences now in the same way that Elvis himself resonated with audiences when he came out in the fifties, Yeah, you know, Definitely. A, and made, made such an impact at that point in time. Um, I'm, I'm curious what you guys think, Uh, because I'm sure you were going to lead to this too, but the idea, because you mentioned it earlier, Mm -hmm. presenting it from Colonel Parker's perspective. Right. Yeah. It's a fascinating way to do it. Mm -hmm. And Baz has gone on record a number of times comparing it to Amadeus. Yeah. Yeah. Which is an interesting uh, touchstone. So on that, what do you guys make of the choice to show it from Parker's perspective? And what do you think that that added? And where do you think it took away? Um, I'll let you. I'll let you start, Joe. I I like it, and I think that mm-hmm. telling the story from Parker's perspective clarifies the struggle that I was just talking about—the struggle mm-hmm. to be true to oneself. Because, you know, Parker sort of represents, I guess, the financial incentive to betray that truth. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, and what makes Elvis. A, a heroic figure in the film is that he is able to shake off all of these forces that are trying to force him to conform to this idea of who he should be. Mm-hmm. And it shows that like the greatest moments in his career, what is admirable about him is that so often he was able to discard all of that and yeah. reinvent himself or, or bring, bring himself, his, his inner self back to the forefront of his art. Yeah. And I think it was a really good decision. I, 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 I liked the framework. Um, I do think it's interesting that, and I understand to a degree why, but I do think that it's interesting that some of the choices they make with Parker specifically, because I, I can kind of get where they're going with it, but I also think that there, there are things that they could have done with Parker that would have been more true to what people who knew him would say Mm -hmm. and some of the criticisms some of the criticisms that we that i heard right away were from people that got to know colonel parker yeah and they were like the colonel wasn't like that this is dumb 
You know, and, and I mean, they had a very visceral, visceral reaction on that level. And now, we could say that that's got something to do with other things as too, but sorry. Here. No, what I was going to say is what I think it takes away from Elvis's story is that it, there's this narrative that Colonel Parker was sort of responsible for everything that went wrong with Elvis's career. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that risks sort of infantilizing Elvis. Yeah. And maybe not own, owning up to the fact that like you know with hollywood and all this stuff he did he did get a little seduced by the fame mm -hmm. he was sort of led um off off his path mm -hmm. you know but he was always able to shake that off and yeah 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 and one thing that i thought was interesting uh in the way that they depict parker is that and and i've talked with a number of elvis fans who didn't pick this up but the whole thing is a hallucination. Yeah. The whole thing, like, some people, because, again, the editing, it being rapid fire and stuff right. like that, some people missed that the morphine is going into his veins. He's right. having a hallucination. It's really just his guilt trip, like his own personal guilt causing a nightmare for him, right. which can kind of, if you buy into that narrative trick, it can explain a lot of what's wrong, historically speaking, about right. what's happening in the, in that world in the in the film. Right. Um, and it also paints what gets focused on in a little different light because right. you go, okay, what matters to not the real Colonel Parker, but what matters to this character? Right. What are the things that he's guilty about? What are the things that he focuses on? Yeah. And you start seeing, oh, he's guilty about how he misled the parents. He's right, guilty right. about how, you know, he did the merchandising. Right. He's guilty about this, but he's always trying to pass the buck and say it was this other thing, which yeah. to be fair, we have evidence of Colonel Parker saying, Oh, you know, I wasn't responsible for this. Elvis went along with it. I'm sure. not at fault. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so that, that is in some respects kind of truthful. And of course it's also answering Throughout the film, the accusations, as you were saying, of, you know, did Colonel Parker, was he singularly at fault for all right. this? Right, yeah, you know? yeah. And Parker hmm. is really gaslighting the audience for the entire movie. Yeah. Right, and then finally passes the buck on to them mm -hmm. at yeah. the end, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, a, that's a, you know, that's a really interesting, uh, we do need to go to a commercial break for just a moment, but uh, we will be, we will be back and we'll talk about that aspect of it because that's got some really fascinating applications. We'll do that after these messages. Okay, we are back. We're talking about Baz Luhrmann's Elvis, and Justin uh, actually had a really great point, something that I didn't think about, as that because the morphine is in Colonel's system at the end of his life, that this is a sort of fever dream, and it's not necessarily exactly the facts and things as they were, but as he is recalling them. Now, that can seem like sort of a cop out for people like I went to an Elvis movie. I want to know what happened to Elvis. What the heck are right. you guys doing? That's the, you know that's BS. I don't care. <laughs> and you know and and uh, but when you look at it, if you look at it from the thing of Colonel Parker's guilt, people feel guilt in situations regardless of whether or not they have guilt. They they should feel guilt. It's internalized things. It's things that they internalize. It's things that they could, might feel guilty about, mm -hmm. regardless of whether, like, you know, cause there, there are people that said, well, the colonel didn't force Elvis in the army. The, you know, the colonel, uh, the colonel didn't say, uh, the colonel didn't say tame it down. The colonel, did, you know, uh, some of these different things, you know, they, uh, uh, the colonel was fine with controversy. In fact, he courted controversy mm -hmm. as long as it wasn't affecting the bottom line too much. He didn't really care. And, so, uh, but the whole thing about, you know, the morphine, about the whole thing being a, a morphine trip dream and kind of bringing forward his guilt and kind of trying to grapple with what, uh, you know, maybe things that he might have felt guilty about, whether or not he should have, could shift that a little bit. Um, I still, like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll always have a little bit uh, of an issue with the even though I understand what they're trying to do, the, the, re, the reaction to the Rustwood Park mm -hmm. thing, that doesn't strike me as, as the Colonel from everything right. that we've, from everything that we've heard, because it's, it's popular. He's going to find a way to sell that, yeah. you know, 
I understand the whole thing about that was the first time Elvis Elvis pushed back, which is something that you and I talked about privately. Yeah, and so I understand that, but um, you know, I, the what can sometimes get lost is just like you know, Elvis was a human being. You know, so is the Colonel, and bringing some of those things. I think there were things that they could have done that would be true to both and still fit nicely within that narrative that they're trying to tell. Yeah. Even though I get where they were going with what they did. Yeah, I don't know, man. Like most of the problems that I have had with the film, I have come to realize are just because um, it's telling a different story than what I was imagining at first. I think, like within the within the context of what the story Baz was trying to tell. Yeah. I think he did it just about as well as you could do. And it's it's a very intelligent film. And the more I rewatch it, yeah. the more I see things that I didn't sort of pick up on. Mm-hmm. Right. There like there's there's a lot he's trying to say in this. It is overstuffed oh, yeah. with meaning. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. And and in the I way the best films are. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I don't mean to say that that oh that took me out of it and ruined it for me. Uh, what I'm what I'm thinking oh, th- this is a relatively small nitpick for me yeah because it presents elvis well and at the end of the day uh, if it presents elvis well that's the first win <laughs> that it's almost the first win of any version of any elvis biopic for me <laughs> because i've always picked them apart from that angle it's like oh god one night one that i can finally relax a little to and we can worry about the other stuff later um you know that's that was kind of my thinking and that's just sort of you know, the if I do have any issues, it would be it would be that, and there would be things that I feel would be easily correct. Very small corrections would have made an impact in in that regard. Um, but yeah, you're you're right. This is so crammed with information, and there's so much that's told so well that it's you know there's there's the there's the micro and the macro. Mm-hmm. What I'm talking about is micro. It is definitely not. On the macro, this thing is impressive and just blew me away. The one thing that I remarked upon at the time last year, around the same time, is that this uh, film, again, going back to kind of what we talked about right at the start of this conversation, everyone's expectations are a little different. And it's important for us to acknowledge that everyone's Elvis movie ideally would be different. Sure, totally. And so it is Baz Luhrmann's Elvis movie, and that has all the baggage <laughs> that can, is contained in that, including what he decides that he wants to focus on. Because you've certainly heard the criticisms, I certainly have, of it didn't show Elvis's generosity. It didn't show Elvis's humor. It didn't mm-hmm. show all these other things that are very true and legitimate criticisms. Sure. It's just you can make similar criticisms of every biopic of Elvis that they didn't include this factor, that factor. Like uh, the 2005 one does depict Elvis's generosity. There yeah. is a scene where Elvis does, you know, give cars away to just random people. Yeah. You know, so that's the, that's one thing that you can go, okay, the 2005 had that one. It check it ticks that box. But if you're going to, you know, do the tick boxing for what it does and doesn't include, you're not taking it as a as a whole, right. as a singular work of art. Yeah, I'd say that's accurate. I mean, like kind of getting back to like some of the nitpicks and stuff, I've got two ways of looking at it. There are things that I like, I'd like to see in it, but then there's also things that, uh, and I do this a lot, I'll look at, okay, this is what they were trying to do. What would I suggest or what would I change that still fits within what they were trying to do, mm-hmm. which is my thing with Colonel Parker. Um, they, but uh, yeah, in, as far as like things that I would like to have seen, you know, uh, Rhonda has said, and I, I would agree with this, is like a little more emphasis on, uh, not wouldn't have even taken very much. If we had gotten to see Gladys maybe a bit more in better times and not so dramatic, yeah. it would be, I, th- I think that that runs the risk. I understand what they're doing because it's Colonel's story, and so she's not really all that important to the Colonel's story, mm-hmm. but uh, or the Colonel's version of his story or whatever. But I think that it, it's... Um, I do see also that there's certain ways that um, focus could be lost on certain things. And I understand... So, so I understand when people say, well, the, you know, there wasn't... There, if there'd been a little bit more of this, this way... I mean, we can nitpick till the cows come mm-hmm. home on everything, like you just <laughs> said, but um, but yeah, it would. I would have. I would have liked to have seen more uh, Gladys, but 
that's not a from the narrative thing. That's right. an additional, you know, that's a different criticism right. than the Colonel thing. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm curious, have either of you two read the script that Deadline dropped? No, I have not. Okay, fascinating read, because it does very different things with Colonel Parker. In the sense that it shifts the narrative, it pulls a little bit more on that conspiracy theory that Colonel Parker may have murdered someone. They mm. leaned into that in the script. Uh, and there's a lot more of the cutting away to Colonel old Colonel Parker in the Mind Casino. Interesting. And there's a lot more of him watching the proceedings mm -hmm. of what's going on. And I think what happened during the edit uh, and during filming is that they realized that the strength of the story was actually still Elvis. Right. Because it's Elvis. And right. also, Austin Butler's Elvis is incredible. Right, yeah. exactly. And if you were going to cast someone else who didn't have that same like commitment to the role as yeah. Austin Butler, like if you cast a Miles Teller or somebody like that, yeah. maybe you would need the more Tom Hanks yep. to carry the film. Sure. And I think they lucked into having such a good Elvis yeah. that they didn't need all that extra Colonel Parker stuff. But what they, <laughs> what they miss out on is him more even more directly confronting the did i did i kill elvis presley okay wow. and it, it goes some interesting places and there's also a little more uh beck and i on tcb cast earlier this year we did kind of a breakdown of some of the differences and stuff between what made it in the film and what didn't mm -hmm. uh and there are more scenes that that got cut that were kind of interesting like there's a tell you what yeah we're going to talk more about that we're going to talk about cut scenes we're going to get to Cutscenes uh, from the script that uh, this will be neat because John and I, I've never heard these things. No, I'm the same here. Man. So I am cu I'm curious. Hopefully you're curious. And that's why we're going to tell you about those when we come back. Okay, we are back and we are talking about Baz Luhrmann's Elvis one year later. We're talking with uh, Justin Gosman and uh, we're going to talk about now. John and I have not read the script, you know, because, you know, you just really... No, I'm just kidding. Uh, John and I have not read the script. It says here, Elvis would talk about... No. Um, <laughs> Touch hands with body. Or uh, body with hands, excuse me. Um, no, so we just Justin was talking about uh, cut scenes where Elvis touches hands with... No. Uh, we're talking about cut scenes from the film, and uh, so... Tell us a little bit about now. Yeah. Warning for those of you who are who knew the Colonel or have a more favorable thing of the Colonel. It seems that the movie uh, does not share the view, so just kind of roll. Uh, we're yeah. just kind of roll. Just kind of roll with that because this is just a this is a narrative of this, and I'm fascinated just from a one year later perspective of where this could have gone because yeah. I'm fascinated and i want to say morbidly curious about yes yeah. uh so the the first thing that would have happened differently is that rather than cotton candy land it would have been colonel parker singing it's cut or it's carnival time wow or lip syncing to a, a remix version of it's it's carnival time Dear that's God. wild i am really happy we didn't get that that's yeah. wowzers. Yeah. I would have liked to have seen it. <laughs> yeah. I'd, like to, I'd like to see it. I just wouldn't want it in the final. But what it, it would have been very much a, a pink elephants on parade of him in the dream casino. You know, the things swirling around behind him, the, 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 you know, the big, uh, uh tables and everything like that. All the pieces, uh, dice rolling giant, you know, the way that it's described is fascinating. Wow. That's the first big like factor that would have changed. Um, there are a handful of scenes early in the film, like even uh, during the, I think it's Blue Suede Shoes montage, early in the film where Elvis is out on tour, there was supposed to be an additional scene where Colonel Parker goes over and talks to Elvis at that diner that's at the roadside. Yeah. And you would have actually have seen, uh, June Carter would have been there. Wow. And there would have been an actual introduction between Elvis and Colonel Parker there. Huh. Rather than them meeting essentially for the first time at the carnival. Right. Like, it's not the first time that they meet as characters. Like, the, obviously, sure. they're in each other's periphery. But that's really the first time that those two connect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. There would have been a proper introduction scene hmm. where Parker starts to weave in little, uh, you know, little pokes and prods that, you know, uh, 
the people who are handling your business right now are not the people who are doing the best for you. Right. And so there's a lot more in the way of that. Uh, hmm. There's a whole scene at that diner. There is an additional extension to the scene uh, where Elvis and Gladys are at home uh, eating dinner. Yeah. There would have been a little bit more of Dixie and Elvis there with Blue Moon playing. Ooh. Oh, that would have yeah. been nice to see. Okay. It would have been really cool. Um, moving a little bit forward in the movie, uh, there really wasn't that much more to like the 60s section of the film or... Uh, the Russwood, uh, that sort of area, that's all mostly the same. The Beale Street stuff is a little out of order, but it's more like I think they shot it as film, uh, as written and then, and then chopped it up differently. Yeah, they found it in the edit, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The 68 special, completely different in the script. Really? Mostly, like in the way it's similar, I think they found it in the edit. Because the pieces are there when you read it in the script. But it is completely different. The tone is all wrong. Huh. The arc of them building the show just doesn't work. They pull a lot more of the actual dialogue in from the 68 special of them going out and Elvis having problems starting, him being nervous, and stuff like that. Rather than him just walking out and just going straight into, uh, is it Jailhouse Rock that he starts off with? Uh, right there? I can't remember. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Heartbreak Hotel. Heartbreak Hotel. Heartbreak yeah. Hotel. Oh, yeah, Rather yeah. than just diving right into Heartbreak Hotel, there's like a delay. And ever, which happened in real life. Sure, sure. Uh, and so it would have been more of Colonel Parker going, hmm, you know, Bindle has this wrong. It's not going to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but there's more with Jerry and Priscilla in the 68 special that would have been in there. Um, but by the last third of the movie is where we get the biggest change, where Colonel Parker gets uh, the information about Colonel Parker gets into Jerry's hands. Ah. We actually see what that information is hmm. in the cut, in the script and in the cut. You know, I, okay. I don't know if they actually filmed this or anything, but essentially, the letter would have been read, and it's from one of Colonel Parker's relatives in the script again. Not in <laughs> not in real life, not based on real life, but no. uh, essentially, it was saying, "Why did you leave mm. the Netherlands? Why have we not heard from you in all this time?" Right. Uh, there's rumors that you may be connected to something that happened here and you get a sense that Parker may be harboring guilt about that as well. Okay. Uh, and about the thing that is, you know, the theory that happened. Sure, sure. Uh, that we all know of. Um, and then, you know, the, the rest of the film is largely the same, uh, in the ghetto is in the script as well. Okay. Right. I don't think it would have played as well as people think it would. Right. Um, the way that it's written in the script. There is more just before in the ghetto where they're actually around the kitchen table. There's like dinner with the Presleys and the Memphis Mafia. Mm -hmm. They actually talk about naming the album from Elvis in Memphis. They talk about, uh, I think Lamar Fike pitches Kentucky Rain to Elvis in that ah. scene. <laughs> Lots of little fine details like that. Like those little Easter eggs and gems okay. for us nerds yeah, yeah. are sprinkled in there too. So we lost that. Hmm. In the ghetto, I, I, I know people are excited about an extended cut of the film. I'm sure it would be edited beautifully, but I would have to see it. Yeah. Because I, I think it was probably the right choice the way it's written in the script. Mm -hmm. But the, the, yeah, the biggest thing there is, is that it's so much more heavy on Colonel Parker. Yeah. And the last bit of the, uh, the, the end with Unchained Melody is that the way that Parker narrates that. In, in the film that we know, it ends with Parker saying, you know, uh, what killed Elvis Presley was uh, the his love for you, right? His audience. He more explicitly says, "And yours for him." Oh, oh. wow! Okay, interesting. Mm, yeah, so he really does just out and out blame the fans, you know, and pass the buck right, right. onto them. So even further gaslighting the audience. Right, right, right. It'd be interesting. Yeah, I think something that I think would be interesting if he's if they're going to do that is make it like make it like him doing that but not how do i put this but have it be the have the read be from a position of weakness mm -hmm. where he's and like he, where you get the sense that he's trying you get even more explicitly the sense that he's trying to do that they, that may have come through in the direction it's yeah. just on the page yeah. It may not look No, like I know. It. I'm just yeah. I'm just saying that I'm just but thinking I think I'm just thinking right. looking at that would have been interesting if they were to do that. This is what I would do. Yeah, exactly. Anymore, you know? Exactly. Yeah. The um uh, yeah, wow, that's fascinating. 
Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's interesting to hear. It seems like it, that cut would have been much more about Parker than the final yeah. product mm-hmm. that we get. Mm-hmm. Well, originally, I mean, because originally... It was Colonel Parker's story. It was Colonel story. Parker's story, right. and Elvis was part of it. I mean, or, you know, uh, and I think it might have been... I've often called the movie Superman Returns a uh, an actor, a Superman actor-proof film because Superman gets like five lines. And I have a feeling that maybe the early drafts of this were an attempt to be Elvis actor-proof just in case. Yeah. And then when they found Austin, when they found somebody who was actually going to apply themselves... As as Austin absolutely did, uh, they could lean a little more on that and allow that to kind of breathe a little more since they they had a tool that they didn't know they were going to have to the, the degree they had it. I think that's a good point, and I would I would like would like to add to this that I think the redactions of Colonel's story and sort of focusing it more on the, his relationship with Elvis and Austin being in the film accomplishes two things. Like, yeah. This is the first Elvis film I have seen, and I have seen all of them. Uh, I'm sorry. At least uh, th- that gets... Elvis from Outer Space, too? I have not seen that one. I didn't know about that I one. I got so. that one up on you. <laughs> uh, I'll have to add that. But um, it's the first one that I think captures a multidimensional sense of who he was as a personality. Yeah. Um, the same idea that you get of him from reading, like, Elena Nash's books. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because usually I, I would be satisfied with an actor who could capture some part of Elvis. And we have been, which is why we liked Elvis Elvis, Elvis Meets Dixon or Elvis and Elvis Nixon. and Nixon, yeah, yeah because yeah. because Michael Shannon did capture sort of his, his intelligence and his yeah. ability to sort of work people, you know? That's where the bar was, folks. But, it was on the ground, a little bit dug in. But this, like, gives you a really rounded sense of who he was. Uh, uh, but also... Unlike the CBS film or miniseries, this actually has things to say about Elvis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It has a perspective on him and a perspective that I think is very valid. Yeah. I love all of the stuff they like the narrative of flight. The, 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 yeah. It's all over that film. The, metaphor. the soundtrack, too. Yeah. yeah. And, and the metaphor of Elvis, as like you said, from the little part uh, that they quote of the fugitive kind at the mm-hmm. end of a bird with no place to land yeah like that gets at the core of of the elvis myth and the person and that like he is someone who is such an individual that there's like there's no 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 place for him you know right he can fly he can be beautiful he can we can watch him soar but like where does he rest you know where does yeah. he come down and, and find a home yeah and like that's a very profound point about Elvis that I'm glad that they made in this film. Mm-hmm. Which is especially interesting when we think about Elvis as someone whose sort of essence of being was making a space for themselves. Yeah. They did, you know, he did, but, you know. But there's still limits to that. Exactly. You know? And maybe he didn't know the extent of it. Right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. You know. He, you know that that I think is the challenge with Elvis too. You, all the stories I've read, and I know that you guys have read of his his quest for spirituality and understanding of why was I selected to be Elvis Presley? Right. Right. You know why? Why me? You know. And I think, as you were saying, maybe he didn't know the extent of that he had created a place for himself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's you can. A lot of things about who we are and how we exist are formed in us early on. So when you think about that, it's one of those things that like, you know, you're pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and, and, and eventually it just becomes a part of who you are and you don't realize that maybe you don't have to. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe, maybe you can take a break. So, you know, that's, yeah. But uh, tell you what, we are going to talk a little bit more about that. That's really some really fascinating stuff. So we're going to talk more about that when we come back from these messages. All right, we are back. And uh, yeah, that's a really, really cool point. Uh, a really good point about, you know, making a space for yourself. And, and as we were saying before the break about, you know, you get used to pushing. It's, I don't know why it's reminding me of the thing uh, from King Creole, you know, it's a hard thing when you're leaning on someone so hard you don't realize you're leaning. Yeah. And 
the same thing is true in in the reverse about you know you're pushing so long you I almost don't realize you're pushing yeah. and so it just kind of like there's nowhere to there's you know there's nowhere to necessarily stop and it just kind of you know the yin and the yang of of mm-hmm. something like this and uh, you know the I mean this is just social commentary but one of the things of about why that I think is is profound is the idea that you know someone with his mindset of you know being you know being a bit of an outsider feeling like an outsider and wanting to having all of these like social stigmas and all of these different things you know there are so many groups of people that can identify with pieces of Elvis's story right. that if it was anybody else wouldn't exist. If it was almost anybody else wouldn't exist. Yeah. And those things are tr- those things can be true and you know and it, and it's the thing is is the trajectory of his popularity uh, I think has made it necessary that it takes this long for that very idea to kind of start to raise up through the ether and take a, a solid shape because, you know, I mean, well, look where we are with so many things. Look, I mean, look where nerd culture is in general. Yeah. I mean, for the longest time, the worst thing you could be was somebody who wasn't a jock. Nobody, how many people have you know i mean no offense to anybody out there who's who's athletic more power to you but you know like that's very much flipped on its head yeah like in you know that's yeah anyway go ahead well one of the reasons i find that bird metaphor so profound is that like elvis sort of came on the scene he succeeded beyond anyone's reasonable expectations Mm -hmm. sort of conquered the entertainment world did more than most people ever do. He's one of the most famous person in the world. And yet, I think he never felt like anything but an outsider. Yeah. You know, he was conscious of that. It's That's something that he has in uh, common with Superman. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. It's true. It's Which, on that point, it's fascinating that they took the superhero angle as well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's so much in there with Captain Marvel Jr. and Captain Marvel lore mm-hmm. that... that um, we touched upon in our TCB cast review last year, you know, just digging into the idea of the music itself being a superpower yeah. that he is tapping into. Because they talk often about the Rock of Eternity. And I don't know how familiar you guys are with I'm sure you've known Captain Marvel oh, yeah. lore. Yeah. But, like, the Rock of Eternity is where Captain Marvel draws his powers from. Right. And that is the music. The music is is the Rock of Eternity. Yeah. Right. You know, and he's always striving to, to reach that. Yeah. You know, and, and Colonel Parker is, you know, always kind of holding it at bay, uh, you know, and, and saying, you know, maybe you won't reach it, you know, by the end of the movie. But See, he's almost portrayed as the seven deadly sins against the far wall. That's yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> the seven deadly sins. But also you can argue Elvis was uh, subject to all of those sins throughout the movie. You know, he has right. lust, he has sloth, he has all, you know, envy and pride and all those and yet the music is the thing that saves him every time. Right. Yeah. Because he's able to tap back into that superpower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's something that we are working on that is on a level that's sort of fascinating that gets into the whole mindset thing that I've talked about, about the way I approach the various time frames in Elvis's life. And uh, I'm not going to spoil anything. Y'all don't get to hear about this yet. Um but it's it's it 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 really is kind of kind of looks at these things and like where did again where does it all come back to where is the where is the focus and you know and the music and i would argue uh i would argue the fans even though it's a shame that i don't think elvis ever fully realized i think he did on some level but not enough internalizing of it that you know how much they were there for him as well Mm -hmm. and all of these other things you know kind of fall away but yeah i love that i think that's beautiful that's a beautiful metaphor and uh 
Does anybody have any uh, closing thoughts or anything that... Uh... The soundtrack was fantastic. Yeah. I mean, you guys fantastic. obviously talked about the, with your remix yeah. uh, episodes and stuff like that, but I just... Uh, you know, it hasn't gotten as many spins from me recently. Individual mm. tracks, sure, not maybe on the whole, right. um, but I thought the the soundtrack was fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, my, I think the last thing that I I would have to say that I hadn't said anywhere is that I think exclusive. No, well, I don't. Uh, I don't it's not worry that about important. It. Hey. Um, I think the biggest thing is that, well, kind of just what I said earlier, that it just, it, it reminds us that Elvis was, why he was exciting and interesting. Yeah. You know, and it remembers to make the movie uh, show Elvis be interesting. Mm -hmm. Right. And there are just so many movies about Elvis, so many books about Elvis, that people who just don't get it, they'll never get it from those things. Right. Sure. You yeah. Know? Well, and th that's the thing about uh, visual medium. It's a shame that, you know, we see we see video of Elvis on television. We see all of these different things. And kind of like a lot of people in the 60s and 70s, oh, they listen to the 50s recordings. Oh, that's in mono. Oh, that's, that's old. That's, mm -hmm. you know, this kind of thing. And so sometimes something needs to be done. I mean, I, my preference is always that it be through the original sources. But there are times when somebody needs they need something for well for instance like you know the ray charles movie ray was yeah. galvanizing for a lot of people mm -hmm. and so you have um something and i think this was a great time in the elvis fandom for that to have hit because i've said to john and apologies i know people are going to be a little upset with the fact that i've even thought of this I've said for a while now that because of where Elvis's fame was in a larger social sense, that it needed to almost go away so it could have a fresh rebirth. And this is, I think, this could very well be if everybody plays their cards right, including the including all the fans out there building things up like what we're doing here. And I'm going to tell you about some of the. I'll tell you about one thing that I've thought of that we'll get into just before we we end. But this could be the resurgence and the renaissance of that. Uh, this could be the kickoff of it. The, that was the other thing that I was thinking of that I blanked out on there for a second. But the idea that the film, I almost wonder if this film is made twenty years too early. No, no, I don't think so. I think it's. I think this is the. I think this is the right time. Because I, I agree. Yeah, I. I just you know again going back to I think fans' expectations. Uh, you know, I, I, even when reading critical reviews, I think people still went in with their own baggage of what Elvis is. Sure. And you almost need to not have that because we're engaging with the material on a thematic level. Mm -hmm. Right. And there were so many reviewers and so many fans that I don't think caught a lot of those things where mm -hmm. with separation like an Amadeus where you're not even thinking about the historical facts right. sure you are able to just focus on what is the film doing as a film I think the film will be rediscovered later for that and I, yeah. I deliberately waited about six months after seeing it before I watched it again and I found on the second viewing it's a much more interesting film than I gave it credit for the first time right there's a lot going on here it is a it is a great film yeah and it is a film that's worthy of elvis mm -hmm. so yeah bears repeat viewings yeah if you haven't watched it again give it another watch think about what it's trying to say divorce yeah. yourself from your elvis fan expectations oh this is not accurate that's right. not accurate yeah. just watch it for what it's trying to say accept mm -hmm. it for what it is and go where it takes you yeah the um i would say that this something like this was the only way that certain conversations and certain resurgences of things, I see this as the start of the conversation. Yeah. Because there yeah. are things that had to be addressed. There were things that had to be said. And kind of like we got into with Hound Dog and things, there were things that had to be kind of ironed out a little bit. Now that this has been told... We can tell a larger story. 
Yeah. And here's the thing. One of the things that one of the things that John and I have talked about doing. I want to see what you all think about this. Now, as you know, I mean, yeah, we're making an, we're making an Elvis we're making an Elvis movie genre movie or maybe we are. Uh, we're at least going to try. But one of the um, which is, you know, difficult considering that we're not going to have Elvis. Uh, you're going to have to put up with me. Apologies there. But, like, one of the other things that I think would be really interesting to do is there are so many stories and things during Elvis about, you know, Elvis's life. So, so many smaller stories that get left by the wayside right. and things like that. Something that uh, John and I have talked about doing is, you know, talking with the people that are still here to tell those stories and, and things and get as much context and all that as possible. I think it'd be really neat. Now that we've had this as a as a like kind of a jump on point, is maybe instead of you know as far as biopic type thing, maybe one thing that would be really cool would be to tell a lot of little smaller vignette stories, so people get and within those vignette stories build a grander image, a more nuanced, a more thorough image of Elvis to push that forward so that it becomes a larger body of narrative for people to see. So we can focus on his generosity. We can focus on how, you know, his, how the connection with his mother uh, shaped him and molded him and do it from a, a viewpoint of keeping in mind about, you know, you know, Elvis, you know, Elvis, the exciting entertainer, Elvis, the heartfelt human being, Elvis, El, you know, generous Elvis, you know, sometimes, you know, maybe in one or two about him being really pissed off about something, you know, whatever. And finding ways to to bring those things forward to start conversations about those individual things to, into a larger narrative. Yeah. So I totally agree. Yeah. yeah. And if we can do it, that's exactly what we're going to do. <laughs> I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation yeah, me too same this is yeah. fun so cool well everybody uh big thank you to uh justin gosman for uh being on the program and uh looking forward to having more uh having him on the show again so this is really really cool so i am jamie and i'm john and i'm justin and this is the eap society the whole point of the elvis archival preservation societies make sure that elvis history is not lost to history and uh making sure that information and different perspectives and all this kind of stuff is available to uh current generations of fans future generations of fans no matter what their budget is because Elvis was really big on being accessible to all of his fans no matter their budget and we like to pay that forward as best as possible in that vein this is not just a YouTube channel this is a movement and this is a people-powered movement which means you so like share comment on the video subscribe to the channel if you're not already bring as many folks in as you can we are a big wide Elvis community and we want to show our love and support for every kind of fandom in the in the Elvis community that we can uh, that means a lot to us, and when we get to 20,000 subscribers, let me dig in here and grab this bad boy. When we get to 20,000 subscribers, we are going to give away this actually Elvis Presley owned item. This, uh, this is a letter opener. This is a very heavy letter opener from the Statler Hilton 1956. Elvis owned this until like 71, 72. And we're going to give this to somebody when we hit 20,000 subscribers. We're going to have a drawing. Somebody's going to win this, and you could win. Something that actually belonged to Elvis won't cost you a thing. We also have an Elvis autograph. We have FTDs we want to give away, all kinds of things. Because, again, this is a movement. We have a lot of big plans. We have a lot of things that we want to do to continue Elvis' story and the legacy and everything that we possibly can to make sure that that information is spread out in as many ways as we can, audiovisually and every other way. If you want to help us out even more, it would mean a whole lot to us. Become a member of the EAP Society. Go to EAPsociety.com, click on Become a Member, and uh, select the tier that you would like. Members get videos early. They get them extended they get extended videos they get exclusive videos exclusive bonus bonus content all that kind of stuff and we really really appreciate all of our members it's a really beautiful group a special shout out to our very own colonel colonel miles foreman uh who uh is uh, uh hopefully is not having fever dreams of his own uh, thank you very <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much uh colonel miles foreman really appreciate you colonel you're awesome anyway uh we do videos on tuesday we have quick take tuesdays and of course our main channel content on friday and uh, love you all. Thank you all so much for checking us out. And until the very next video, be good to yourselves. Be good to each other. And always, TCB. My society, my society, here with all the friends I want to see. Don't need no high society to get me where I want to be. My society.
city, yeah, that's for me. Oh, my society, yeah, that's for me. Oh, my society.